Thank you. And hello, everybody. So I'm Luca Canali, and uh, I'm excited to be here and talk to you about some of my favorite topics, performance investigations, Spark, and flame graphs. A quick slide about me. So I'm a database engineer at CERN. I work in the Hadoop and Spark service and the database services. I joined CERN in 2005, and I have about 16 years of experience architecting and running uh, database operations. I have a Twitter account, um, a web page where I normally post the um, slides of the, of the talks that I do, and I also have a blog. By the way, this talk comes out of a blog entry that I've written about a month ago and has been kindly reposted by Databricks on their engineering blog. So you can find there more details that I had to skip in the presentation for lack of time. Okay, next. Uh, a little, I guess many of you know already about CERN, a little introduction to it anyway. So CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. It has more than 60 years of history. It has started with 12 uh, member states. Now it has 22 member states who run it, mostly European states. But it's actually home to a worldwide collaboration of uh, many countries. Uh, we have about 10,000 users that come from uh, around 110 countries collaborating with CERN and with the experiences and that are run at CERN. So the Large Hadron Collider is located at CERN and is the largest and most powerful particle accelerator in the world. You can see here a picture in the tunnel. So the accelerator is located underground at about 100 meter, meters and it is 27 kilometers in circumference. It's really big science. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider has already made history with the discovery of the Higgs boson that has been announced back in July 2012. LHC physics is data and compute intensive. As of October 2016, there are about 170 and 160 petabytes of data archived on tape, collected by the experiments that take data from LHC. And this is only going to grow. At the moment, we're growing at a 50 petabyte per year, but there are plans in the next 10 years to increase this uh, significantly. The computing power needed to uh, process and analyze uh, all this data is quite important. There are about 300,000 cores at the moment, and there is a worldwide effort to do this, uh, coordinated by the worldwide LHC computing grid. There are several technologies that have been developed over the years, for actually for more than 20 years, that are used to process uh, this data. So there are custom data formats, applications, and, uh, and frameworks. In particular, I would like to mention Root, which at the moment is a very important piece in all this in uh, infrastructure. Now getting uh, to uh, the topic of the conference, Spark. This is relatively an, uh, newer uh, for CERN. Uh, Spark and, in general, the Hadoop ecosystem. And we are ramping up our services on it. Uh, at the moment, we have about three production clusters that have a, a total of about 1,000 cores, 3 terabyte of RAM and 1.2 petabyte of used space. Some of the uh, uh, projects that use Spark are analytics for the accelerator, controls and logging, which is a very important piece of uh, infrastructure for CERN. Also, there are various monitoring services and use cases, which notably uh, make uh, an important use of Spark streaming. And then there are applications on analytics uh, for aggregated logs into a data lake that we have built. And there are explorations on the usage of Spark for physics analysis to complement and uh, maybe in the future also uh, replace some of the current workloads. Okay, getting to the main uh, topic of this presentation, it all started with a simple case from production. We had a relational database and a, a doc report that one of our users, a network expert, needed to run for some of their activities. This report, even after some tuning, uh, was actually quite slow, running in more than 12 hours. It turned out to be a CPU bound and also single threaded. Single threaded because we don't like to have parallelism in our relational databases that are actually tuned for transactional workload. So some of the activities that uh, the, um, the team that took this ticket did was uh, take the data and export it into a Hadoop cluster using Apache Scoop, and then running it over there. And uh, it, it, it happened, actually, that it was running in 20 minutes with the SQL completely unchanged. 
So this was a, a nice way to solve the problem. Instead of using brain cycles, we used CPU cycles that in this case were cheaper. It's just a one-off problem. So quite neat and cost-effective. So I started looking at that. I found the example quite interesting. And I, I actually ran it also on Spark 2.0. So in production, we currently have Spark 1.6. So I just took a test machine. And I was expecting some performance improvement because I had just read a very nice blog post uh, that was published in May uh, by Databricks Engineering on all the uh, good features that there are in Spark to increase the performance. And we heard at, today on several talks by the Spark SQL team about that. And actually, I found that it was really faster. And at one point, I was able to bring it down from 20 minutes to two minutes. And I thought this must have been because of the optimization of Spark 2.0 on CPU intensive workloads with a whole stage called code generation and vector operations. So this brought to a little uh, takeaway. So there's a very short summary of actually, actually the message of this presentation that is Spark SQL provides parallelism affordable at scale. One can scale out IO intensive workloads, but more specifically for the case that we had. In, the, in, the, in this case, from production, CPU-intensive or rather memory-intensive queries, because when we use CPU in database workloads, or typically it's because of memory access. And this is quite a, a good way to do it at, at affordable scale. And the concept of floating queries from relational databases into uh, systems like uh, Spark is a very good idea. And Spark 2.0 actually runs even faster than Spark 1.6, so it's even a better idea. This is a short takeaway for maybe some of you who are new to the environment of Spark. If you are actually more experienced into it and actually you like more on the, uh, to go on the deep side of performance tuning, there are some points that were, were just skimmed over. I, I mentioned that some workloads that I ran went from 20 minutes to 2 minutes because of some reasons that I read about. What is really needed here is to go into road cost analysis. So I would like to take you into some investigations on, uh, with the idea of doing active benchmarking. So to run the workload that we need to test and measure it with different tools. Also, having an understanding of the tools is quite important. I think some of you will find it interesting. Maybe you already know some of those. And the goal is to understand what is going on, where are the bottlenecks, why something runs at a certain speed and not faster or slower, and to see what, what's behind it. Of course, it will never be perfect because it's limited by the tools that we are available and how we can understand them, and also the time that we have for the investigation. I think this is a generic point that I want to make that I think is very useful to do when doing performance and performance comparisons. So um, instead of using the query that we had in production, I prefer to use a test case that makes it, I think, more generic and reproducible. You can take it and, and run it in your own cluster if you want to. And the first thing is to create a data frame with 10 million rows and some, a bunch of random uh, columns. Uh, I've used here Python and SQL because I'm familiar with it. But the nice thing about Spark is that you can use Scala if you wish, and you can use declarative interface. It all goes down to the same pipeline at the end. This is the SQL. So the SQL is built in a way that it resembles uh, it, the uh, actual problem. And in particular, it, is, it has a complex SQL with a, at least one non-equijoin um, condition, which is this one. And also aggregations that make the thing a little bit more complex. And, uh, and then we will see um, what this gives us. So the first point, if you're tuning SQL in any system, is to go and, and check the execution plan. It tells you, this tells you what the engine wants to do. Also, we already know that we are going in the area of optimizations of Catalyst, the optimizer, and actually, in particular, of Tungsten, the execution engine. So execution plan is the main thing. I will get back to that in a, in a better view with the web, web UI, but I think it's, uh, it's also quite nice to have uh, this that comes just from the explain uh, method on the SQL. The main points I want to bring on is that uh, what the SQL does is a sort, mer sort merge join, which actually makes the thing quite uh, heavy. Uh, it's, uh, because also the, the table actually, it is actually used two times and joined with itself as 10 million rows. So this multiplies up. And the, the tables, OK, are in, in cached in memory. And then there is filtering and aggregation. 
I'll get back to uh, this execution plan with the web UI. But the point that I want to, to make now, you see this plan in a Spark 1.6, and now you have the same one on Spark 2.0. There is a subtle difference that I want to point out immediately is the presence of these asterisks. Actually, this is called uh, code generation. The plan looks similar, in particular, the sort merge join is there, and, and then there is aggregation as well, and filtering, there are some, some of the details are a little bit different, of course, different versions, they change a few things. Another view of the same thing is with this, probably not very readable uh, from the back, maybe you can download the uh, presentation later on. But here in the web UI, as has been shown actually uh, earlier by previous talks on the uh, Spark SQL team, you can see that whole uh, stage code generation is explicitly spelled out when it's actually applied. And also you have these rectangles that uh, explicitly uh, say make it clear that a certain type of operations are put together and are code generated. Okay, so with the plan and with the web UI, we, we can see that there are differences. We can see that the magic sauce that makes everything go around faster is the uh, code generation. But this is not finished. We want to use actually different tools and uh, understand this from different angles to make sure that we are getting this right and also get to the flame grounds. And uh, one thing that is important to check is to, uh, to check that the workload is CPU bound. So I ran this just on a test machine. So isolated, local mode, so it's all nice and easy. I just get one process, it is multi-threaded, and it's much easier for the, um, for the measurements, actually. And this was clear, there was CPU bound, basically this machine was not doing anything else than running this workload in, with just minor uh, things that were going on in the background. So for um, profiling CPU bound workloads, there is a very good technique that is called frame graph, or rather flame graph visualization of stack profiles. Maybe some of you have, are already familiar with it, and already seen on a presentation earlier today where a frame graph was presented. And this has all been started basically by Brendan Gregg, who has a lot of presentations about that. I have some links about it. This is the GitHub where you can get all the code. And this is a very popular method. It's available for many uh, environments. Every environment where you can get stack, stack um, profiles, you can get uh, basically flame graphs. So, and, and for uh, JVM, this is the case that we want to investigate this time. So what is this useful for is to understand where CPU, are, CPU cycles are spent. So if the workload is CPU bound, for example, because of access to memory, then it, it's a good fit. So how to get stack, uh, stack traces for Java? So if you just need to get one to get an idea of what is going on, for example, if the workload doesn't change, maybe just get one. You can use JStack. Otherwise, there are two methods that are um, more suitable for profiling. I will mention it in this presentation. It's Java Flight Recorder and Linux Perf. Linux Perf is also a generic one that can be used, for example, for profiling uh, C programs. So uh, there is not so much time to describe in uh, full details uh, the flame graphs, but just some of the main points here is that the idea is to, mo to get multiple stack traces, aggregate them by sorting them alphabetically by function name, and visualize using stack color boxes, and the length of the box will be proportional to the time spent in that function. So basically, if you think of different snapshots in time, you will have a time one, you'll have this, time two, time three, time four, and then it, when you want to process the graph, you put them together and merge. What gets difficult, if it's the, if it's the first time you see this, is that the x-axis, while well, here we are get just, this is the raw data we are getting, so this is the time. When we merge and sort, then the x-axis is no more time. So it's an arbitrary x-axis. So it gets a little bit to wrap your mind around it. Okay, so this is the flame graph of the workload that I mentioned before when run on Spark 1.6. So the stack is quite, uh, it's quite deep. So the functions that are actually on CPU are the ones that are on the top. But the ones that are below, they also provide some context. And also nicely from the name here, all the met methods that are executed, we can see 
uh, we, we can understand or guess what is going on. So one of the things that keeps repeating in the names of the functions over here is the fact we are looping on, on, the, on rows of data. So there, is, there are iterators that keep reading row by row and then doing aggregation. For example, here it says tungsten aggregation iterator process input. This, this large one that covers basically everything is tungsten aggregation iterator. So tungsten, the execution engine, has something to do with the performance here, and iteration over rows has something to do. Indeed, this is what we expect. This is the, uh, the volcano model that has, has been uh, described actually in, uh, in good details uh, this morning by Samir. This is what basically all databases uh, do, at least of the old school, all the relational databases, and the ones that have been around for, for some time, do they typically iterate over rows because it's easier and it's quite, actually makes it e much easier if you have different data types to handle. What uh, modern databases, especially the ones that are optimized for in-memory processing, so that is when a large amount of the time is spent on CPU processing data, so in-memory, not necessarily everything, uh, do is that they implement code generation. So instead of looping, they basically uh, code generate the operations so that this is more efficient on the CPU caches and uh, it makes it run much faster. You can get the details indeed in uh, Samir's presentation this morning. So, but the idea is to replace the loops and, uh, and, the, and the virtual function calls. And another uh, piece of optimization that is done uh, by databases these days is uh, vector operations. So to make use of operations like SIMD that are present in modern CPUs. And this typically gives one order of magnitude improvement. So we are getting to the order of magnitude improvement that I mentioned at the beginning for the workload that we examined in our production. As I mentioned, the, uh, the databases that have a longer history typically don't have uh, this optimization. They still use a slower volcano model. And the main topic that we hear over and over at, at this conference, but also in others that have to deal with databases, is that CPU workloads are becoming more and more important. In the past, databases were a lot about I.O., so if you're waiting for random I.O., for example, on a spinning disk, that's so slow that you don't have to care so much about CPU cycles. So bring back time, I don't know, to the 90s, the beginning of the 2000s. But these days, we have a lot of memory also on commodity servers, and so a lot of workload goes on CPU cycles. Also, if you're using SSD, SD, um, solid-state disks, um, you will see that they are fast, so they get a lot of... Uh, uh, data into the, uh, pumped into the CPUs. Okay, so the next is the flame graph for Spark 2.0. Spark 2.0 has the optimizations of code generation and some vector operations. And indeed, for the same workload, when we do the same flame graph, we see something different from what we have seen in the Spark 1.6. So when we start reading the name of the methods executed, we see things like whole state code gen execution and also at the top, so that the function that gets on CPU, we see the vectorized hash map. So we have whole stage code generation and vector operations that are going on. So the two optimizations then they make uh, workloads run faster as opposed to the old school. Okay, so indeed, that was why the workload on Spark 2.0 was faster than Spark 1.6. Once more, I go back two slides, Spark 1.6, the flame graphs tells me, or at least hints to the fact that we have loops on rows of data. Spark 2.0, the flame graphs hints at the fact that we, also, we have a whole uh, stage code generation and vector operations. Okay, another message here is that flame graphs are quite cool, nice graphs, and also useful. Uh, to examine uh, CPU-bound workloads. So how can you make the flame graphs? Probably if you want to do it, you'll have to just sit down and there are some documentation that I, that I um, point to here. But we just can go through some of the main points that you have to be aware of if you want to run it. If you want to use a method with Java Flight Recorder, uh, the thing, and uh, for example with PySpark, uh, the thing you will have to do is to activate a couple of options. One is unlock commercial features, which also hints to the fact that you have to also look at the file or the licensing option if you want to use this. 
especially in production. I think for test is no problem. But for production, you have to look at that. And then there is another option, uh, the flight recorder. So you want to have that uh, on, uh, on your configuration. You can put it in uh, Spark Defaults so, uh, conf or in the command line interface. Then with JCMD, you just activate the, um, the gathering of the, uh, of the data here, of the Java flight recorder. This goes on asynchronously. And at one point, you, you'll end up with a file with the, uh, the extension JFR with a, in a special format. Then you need to uh, run that file. Somebody has kindly done this already, a way to, uh, to read this JFR and put them in an output that can be used for flame graphs. I, um, it, I, I listed the, the, uh, the link for that. And, and then you can use the, uh, the tool by Brenda and Greg to generate the flame graph. The flame graph actually is generated as an SVG, which has uh, nicer features than what I've shown here. That was just a static image. With an SVG, you can also over to the graph and see all the details. The exact recipe of, uh, of the steps that you have to follow if you want to do that is on this uh, article by Kay Austerhout. So you can, uh, you can uh, have a look at that. It's quite simple. I just want to mention that there is another mode uh, to uh, gather uh, data for the flame graphs is to use uh, perf, Linux perf. This is the method that is described in details by Brendan Gregg, and he calls that mixed mode flame graph. Because if you use perf, you get uh, data from Java, from JVM, but also from the OS. So for example, if you have also CPU cycles going on in the kernel or in the user space outside JVM, you will uh, be able to gather that with this method, while with the, um, the previous method, oh, it's only Java. So uh, I, there are some details that you have to be aware. If you use that, you need to use a, rec a relatively recent uh, Java version. And there are other configuration options that you have to set. That work, uh, these options work around some problems with the JVM and gathering uh, stack traces. For example, one has to put preserve frame pointer. And uh, in many cases, also um, avoid inlining functions. Otherwise, there are functions that just disappear from the flame graph. And this one has performance implications. So, so there are trade-offs. Uh, these techniques are always a little bit experimental. And then this is what you will do for uh, recording uh, with perf the stack traces. Actually, with the same command is also used for uh, non-Java environments. And then uh, other complications are there, like the fact that you need to dump symbols, et cetera. And, uh, but you can, f I'm sorry? No. I thought it was a question. OK. This is that. I've shown you two methods, Java Flight Recorder and Perf events to do that for the Linux uh, mix mode. Uh, third one that I just want to mention briefly is some tool that we built um, at CERN. A student of ours built it, uh, Yuri. And this one uh, is, is a generic tool uh, that automates the collection and aggregation of stack traces to build the flame graphs for generic distributed applications. In, particularly, in particular, it integrates with YARN, and it will identify the processes and the machines where the trace has to be activated. And it will collect the traces and, and get, uh, get them and merge them together. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that. So a recap on the flame graph. So I'm saying it's, a, it's an interesting uh, technique and tool that you should be aware of. And the pros of it is that it's a technique that is very good to understand where CPU cycles are spent. So it's quite important if you have a CPU-bound workload. So you can use it for performance troubleshooting and for internal investigations. Uh, the functions at the top of the flame graphs will tell you what is on CPU. But at the same time, you will have a context that is given by the uh, functions and methods that you will see below the, um, the top of the, uh, the flame graphs. That, and the names of those functions will tell you something about what the workload is doing. There are a lot of limitations. It's not a technique that you can use for everything. Right? Uh, for example, off CPU and wait time are not charted. There are special frame graphs that actually go in that direction, but it gets more complicated. You can investigate that following the links that I mentioned. And also, we are aggregating at the function level, so we lose some details. In particular, if we see that a certain function is at the top 
or the flame graphs, we don't really know what is happening inside that function. And the interpretation of the flame graphs, as we have done in this talk, requires some knowledge and uh, sometimes some knowledge of what the system is doing, some experience, some external context. Do you have to look at the top one, the second, the third, the fourth one? So it's a, it's a, it's a very useful technique, but it has some limitations and uh, it requires a little bit of understanding to be used. Okay. Just getting uh, towards the end of the talk, I want to mention again in this context of doing active benchmarking, so examining the workload on different directions, other things that one can do. From the flame graphs, we get the names of the, of the functions that are executed, so we can go on GitHub and look for them. This is a nice thing about open source, that the source is there. So I actually have learned a few things looking at those two, or whole stage code gen execution and vectorized ice map generator. There are some comments in the code that you, find, you can find there where they explain what, are, what is the logic of what is going on. And I think this is quite interesting if one wants to drill down further from the flame graph. So the flame graph gives us the name of what is executed, the other functions, but if you want to know exactly what's going on, you have to look at the code, for example. One last point, again about Linux perf, but this time perfstat. This is a very useful tool that you want to use if you have, for example, a CPU-bound workload again. What I've done on this workload, I was looking at the CPU, again, to confirm that the, C the workload was CPU-bound, and also at the last level cache load and load misses. This gives information of the throughput between the CPU and the memory, because when you have a, a CPU-bound workload, on a database environment or Spark and data processing, it's typically because you need to access memory. And indeed, the bottleneck of this workload was typically memory. And what I could find, and okay, the data are in the blog post, uh, it would be too long to describe it here, what I could find is that on Spark 2.0, the throughput to memory was so much higher than on Spark 1.6 that actually was spending a lot of time doing other CPU operations Spark 2.0 was almost always stalling for memory. Spark 1.6 was also doing CPU processing and stalling for memory. So access to memory is key, and you have tools that can, allow, that can help you to understand it. If you're running on virtual machines, this doesn't really work very well, so that's, that's, a, that's a problem there, I think. But if you run on uh, bare metal, this one is quite useful. And I hope in the future that we can see more instrumentation that allows us to understand the throughput between CPU and memory, because this is key for a lot of workloads. OK, conclusions are similar to the uh, early wrap-up that I've done before. So two points that I want to mention is that Apache Spark is scalable on performance and commodity hardware, so it gives us scalability on an affordable level. So it's good for IO intensive uh, computing, uh, for IO intensive workloads and for compute intensive queries, which was actually the case, both of the production example and of the uh, synthetic query that I uh, have illustrated here. And also another point that I want to bring is that if you have queries in relational databases, other systems that need, uh, for example, performance, need parallelism, um, offloading them to Spark and use Spark SQL is a good idea. And uh, sometimes it's quite simple because, like uh, in the case that I illustrated, the query could run unchanged. Spark 2.0 with code generation and vector operations run faster than Spark 1.6. Really important improvements. The speed up is about one order of magnitude. It's also very important to have good uh, diagnostic tools and uh, to know how to use them, to test them first, for example, in test environments before using them in production. Some of the tools that we mentioned here are execution plans, so how to read them, how to, to generate them first, and how to read them. Linux perf events, Linux stats that I just mentioned, and also flame graphs, which was one good part of this presentation. Quickly, a big thank you to my colleagues back at the Hadoop and Spark service at CERN. And a lot of the original ideas, especially around flame graphs, are by Brendan Gregg. You can see here the reference. And uh, now I open for questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Uh, so if we have any questions, we have uh, some time left. Uh, there are two mics in the middle of the, uh, the hall, so please feel free to ask questions. No? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank you.
So as a quick reminder, uh, we have a networking reception at the Expo Hall starting at 6 p.m., so please uh, stop by there if you get a chance. Thank you very much.